This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. Our website is ccc.qbook.tv, where you can find other audio and video episodes with photos, links, and information related to today's conversation. Subscribe to leave comments and access research episodes with applied topics and research reports. Here we are, talk of Asian marketing. And if you're picking this up on your podcatcher or an iTunes, why don't you come on over and visit the site? Let me start again. <laughs> Welcome to Talk of Asian Marketing. If you're picking this up on your podcatcher, on iTunes, or some other way on the web, why don't you come over and visit the site at cccqbook.tv, right? cccqbook.tv. I want to make sure I don't get that wrong. Come over there, lots of research information, lots of stuff. If you register, you get a lot of in, uh, access to papers and data, and a lot of stuff we're working on, working papers, published papers, stuff like that. Everything else is free, and that doesn't cost money. You just need to register, and there's no link-ups with any kind of uh, junk email. You haven't got any junk email from no, us, have you? Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm Clyde Warden, and this is Darcy Kasky. And Darcy, Darcy has been with us before on show number one. I think. So number one for at Costco. Yeah, at Costco. Wow, that was number one. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a year ago, right? Oh. Right. Has your membership at Costco run out? Uh, actually, I was just there today, so it still works. <laughs> okay. My my membership ran out last month. I haven't renewed, but I don't need a membership because I still got tons of Costco food in my refrigerator. <laughs> we got a huge relish thing. We got we got tons of food. We can't eat it all up. So I kind of regret joining. Uh, Costco, to tell you the truth. Well, I, I live alone, so I live alone, so I don't really need it either. But sometimes there's some useful things. So. Well, what do you do if you just need a little bit of ketchup or just a little bit of relish, right? <laughs> some of these huge things. Anyway, that's another show. That's show number one, two, and three. I think go back, check that out. That was a lot of fun. Today we have a completely different topic, but a really interesting topic, and something that Darcy and I have been doing together for a while, and that is um, cycling. Cycling. Yeah. Right? Is that what you call it? Cycling. This is the mountainside. This is, uh, what's the name of this mountain? Uh, Dadu Mountain. Dadu Mountain in Taichung, central Taiwan. Now, there's mountains everywhere. Uh, some of them are climbable and some of them are not. This is one of them. And near here is Donghai University. Yeah, that way. Right behind us is Taichung City. Really beautiful tonight. It's just lighting up right now. And Many years ago, I think, say, about seven years ago, I got a bicycle. And me and my son would cycle up here, and we'd also cycle some other areas. And there was nobody here. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. And you've been cycling up here for a while. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I bought my first bike in, when I was in Taiwan, I think, in 2001. 2001. And at that time, that time the, the only same people who were me. cycling were students and older people. Yeah, of course, you've always had in Taiwan, like, the, you know, Lan Lan Po Po, the bicycle. Yeah, you know, yeah, this single gear. Single gear, broken down bicycle. There's always been these little tiny bike shops everywhere. But right around the turn of the century, you started to see a little bit of a shift, right? Even in those small shops, you began to see much more upgraded bicycles for sale. And then you had these chains, especially of Giant, opening up. Yeah. You've been to those shops. And actually, that's more recently. Mm. I think it's probably about three or four years ago. Mm. Four, three or four years ago, the stores were all mom and pop, very, very, well, no decorations, just bikes hanging on the walls yeah. and uh, a couple guys maybe smoking behind the desk. But about three or four years ago, yeah, Giant and Marina came around and they upgraded all their stores to be quite, quite fancy. Yeah, so the upgrade goes for the, the stores that are still the mom, could still be mom and pop shops, but they're part of the Giant uh, family and then they just upgrade their shops. A lot like the motorcycle show we had a couple of shows ago with uh, Sim and Yamaha where they kind of push that upgrade yeah. down, that service orientation. Yeah. But then you also have the shops that are completely devoted to this new kind of approach in retailing, which are the big giant stores. Yeah, so they, get, they have two, I guess I, Merida must follow the same plan where they have the, they have the as you said, the, the company-run stores and the mom-and-pop ones. Mm -hmm. And like, as, as the motorcycle uh, 
show that you had. They also have managers that come down and enforce their really? standards. Come down, they check all these details. Yeah, or else they can lose their franchise. Yeah, right. So what caused this? Why do we see that anyway? What's the deal? Uh, I don't know. In my opinion, there's a, there's a few, there's a few uh, I guess events that kind of happened about three or four years ago. Mm. Maybe a convergence of different reasons. Like uh, one was uh, gas prices, although I don't think that's not the main reason, but gas prices. It's a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, that's a good excuse. Another one, uh, the government started promoting some of these bike trails. Mm -hmm. Earlier you were at a different bike trail bike today. Trails. That before was quite quite plain before, but it's becoming Well, in fact, upgraded. there used to be no bike trails anywhere. I mean, maybe in Taipei there were, I don't know, but in Taichung there was never any. And in fact, when we rode around on motors, on uh, bicycles on sidewalks, because some of the new areas of Taichung would have really wide sidewalks, kind of like here, you know, you used to have really narrow or nothing, now you get wider ones. My kids were riding right along. We, were, we have been attacked by old people. Get off the sidewalk! Don't you know it's against the law? And you know, technically, it is against the law yeah. to ride your bicycle on a sidewalk in Taiwan, which is funny because everybody parks, parks their scooter on a <laughs> parks their car even <laughs> on the sidewalk, right? It's against the law to ride your bicycle. So there was really nothing you could much do, you know, besides students just going to class. But yeah, you're right. I saw that all of a sudden we begin to see more and more people because there were more and more trails, and it seemed like the government was spending more effort on that. But then all of a sudden. You know, it just exploded, and this is like basically the last year, I think. It's yeah, just a complete it's explosion. It's amazing trend. Like you can see behind us, people are riding up and down here. But yeah, if you went back three or four years ago on any of these roads, you would never see any of these people. No, no way. You would not see anybody. And then I think a key point from the retailing side is the type of bicycle, mm -hmm. right? So in my case, you know, I went out after I graduated my PhD. I kind of treated myself. I got a new bicycle. We've been riding kind of junky bikes from Carrefour, you know, something like that. I went to a giant store, got a bike, came home. My wife said, oh, good, that's good, treat yourself. And uh, how much was it? And I said, well, it was uh, 15000 And And she said, oh, that's nice, darling, that's a nice Christmas present. And uh, my son and I were kind of like, you know, doing a double take on that, you know. She was hearing 1500 <laughs> right? And the difference here is what? The difference is like 50 U.S. dollars compared to like 500 U.S. dollars, right? And it was a 500, it was about a 500 U.S. dollar bike, but it was a good deal for, you can get really good deals in Taiwan. The thing is, they never existed before. You couldn't get good bikes like that before. Yeah, that's it. And considering Giants being the number one manufacturer in Taiwan, and Merida, they, they were all exporting their highest, yeah. highest end bikes overseas, and no one would buy those bikes at right. first. They right. just would have the really cheap bikes that you could pick up secondhand for $200. Exactly. So I think the manufacturers had kind of a, a lot of experience, they built up a reputation, they had really good bikes, and then a kind of a fad starts. And you know the way fads go in Asia, yeah. right? Yeah, well, I don't know if you remember, there's that movie that came out about the, the student on spring break who decides to cycle around Taiwan. <laughs> and that happened before the cycling yeah. fad happened. Yeah. Yeah. But after that movie came along, I think it made a huge influence. Yeah, I'm not saying that movie just caused it, but... Well, you were telling me about a couple girls that were cycling around oh, there, yeah, published yeah, a yeah. book about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think the media came together just at the right time. They push on it. These are all part of these fads in, in Asia. You know, the media just reports on the fad. It's an easy report, and then it gets to kind of feed on itself in a cycle. So now you go to these stores, and you get these really high-end bikes. And we were at a store today, and uh, we got some video, and we're talking, you know, 30000 minimum for some of those bikes there. Those are imported bikes. The giant bikes, the good ones range what? Yours is a giant, right? Mine's a giant, and mine was... When I first bought it three, three years ago, I guess it was about 24000 Now when I look at it, I went back recently mm. to look to see the same model and make is now 28 or 29 Wow. So because it's the prices actually are, inflated. Because there's such a huge amount of bikes that are being sold that the price is actually inflated. I've got to sell my bike. That's <laughs> I gotta do. Yeah, i got to go back and check mine. So you've seen an inflation in prices just because of the supply and demand imbalance, right? And almost everyone has a bike now. And they have high-end bikes. We just came in here to shoot the video. And we were looking at a family. And we're talking, these guys had, I don't know, the, I'm not a cyclist you know, connoisseur, but they had some imported brand. And everyone in the family had it. Uh -huh. And you know that's got to be costing, you know, 30,000, 40,000 NC dollars, which is about 1,000 US dollars. Yeah, the clothes, right? Uh -huh. yeah, the clothes and the paraphernalia. So that's the really big market, isn't it's it? A huge, it's a huge market with all the paraphernalia. In fact, we went to Carry For, even Carry For is doing it. You walk into Carry For, they got paraphernalia everywhere. We went on the uh, little street market on one of the trails. They have paraphernalia. Everyone's selling it. 
But you go into the bike stores, they're still selling it at those really high prices. And people are willing to buy it too. That's, that's, I think it comes part of the biking fad is you also, you also should have the right clothes and stuff to match the fad. You gotta fit in. Yeah. You gotta fit in. It's kind of like getting a Harley and you gotta get the leathers and everything, you know. You gotta get everything that goes with it. So the bicycle helmets, I have to tell you, you know, when I started biking, we could not find good bicycle helmets. In fact, it was not uncommon then to see people on bicycles with those little dinky motorcycle helmets. Uh, I still see a few of those around. <laughs> and they have the visor that yeah. comes down. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. So I think it's a classic. I mean, I don't want to make a prediction because this is going to go on to the website and the next five years it's going to be there and I'm totally <laughs> proven wrong. But I have to say this is, fits right into what I've seen over the years as a fad really a, a fad in the Asian region. Fads in Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, they tend to take off really fast and grow spectacularly, and money is no object. Yeah, and they don't have the diversions, uh, say, back in America or Canada or Europe, where there's many different groups. Mm -hmm. This one's kind of more like a larger single group, so exactly. they're all doing right. it as a Right, exactly. I mean, movement. give you a silly example off the top of my head. Um, it's hard for you to find groups that are doing these small things. Like if you want to do Dungeons and Dragons, you're not going to be able to find a club at Fungja that does Dungeons and Dragons. You probably won't even find like a Linux club there. Yeah, I don't think so. yeah you see? So it's these, I agree with you 100%, they don't have these smaller groups. It tends that the culture doesn't emphasize you going off and doing your own thing with a group of other people just thinking in a similar way. Rather, everyone's working towards these common goals. And when a fad comes, boom, everybody joins into the fad. Early 90s, late 80s fad, fish tanks. Yeah, you see them now, nowadays on the street outside houses that are being renovated, the broken fish tank. That's <laughs> right. Everybody had to get a fish tank, and they it just bigger and bigger and bigger. And no matter where you go into somebody's house, they have a huge fish tank. And then the fish. You have to get the expensive, expensive fish. And now it's common if you drive along the street at night, you can look into someone's house and you see an old empty fish tank out yeah, there yeah. in their house. Or you go, yeah, you go to rent an apartment, you often see a fish tank, an empty fish tank with dust <laughs> in the side. And exactly. No Exactly. So that was a big fad. And people were crazy about it. In fact, they even started, you know, when you, when you talk to them and say, look, you're going to go out and spend 50,000 NT for a fish. Don't you think this is a little bit crazy? And they said, no, it's an investment. <laughs> Somehow they got in their heads an investment. It's a real face thing, too, you know. Um, they're doing it. They're doing it. I'm doing it. We all join in, have the common thing. What's some other fads we can think of? Bowling alleys. Were you here during the bowling alley fad? That was, after, that was before I came here. <laughs> in the late 80s, you, uh, I tried to go to a bowling alley, and I was told you can't go to a bowling alley, it's only where gangsters hang out. So there's like one, I think, in Taichung. But then in the early 90s, they just popped up everywhere. Everywhere were bowling alleys. These were not small investments, right? Cash in fast, make a lot of money. What's another fad after that? Another fad that came along would be... Um, Oh, well, dogs. Oh, yeah, yeah, the dogs are really, that's a good one. Because it goes along with the movie thing we mentioned earlier. Right. right. There, yeah. was, there, there was a series of movies, especially from Japan. Yeah, dogs. yeah, yeah. So one year it was a, dog, a movie about uh, Labradors. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The yeah. next that year, Labradors would be everywhere. Super yeah. popular, yeah. Uh, right. Whereas before, no one even had a dog. Right, I mean, in, I, if you would ask me, like, in 1990, what's the chance that the pet market would take off with that one? I'd say, absolutely no way. People wouldn't waste money on that. But now it's, you know, totally opposite. But is, is this, are these fads or are these um, fashions or trends? Yeah, it's, hard to, it's hard to say. The, the biking one, I think it's a fad, but it seems like it, maybe, maybe it'll, maybe it'll stay on because people, well, there's infrastructure now. The subways are yeah. creating cars in the front. Well, I just heard on the high-speed train, they encourage you to take a bike. And they have those folding ones that are apparently very easy to carry around. It's a healthy fad. A lot of trails now. There are a lot of biking trails. I mean, a lot. I should put a lot in quotation marks, right? It's not... I don't think it compares to some places in the U.S. and Canada where they're just everywhere. But there are more than there were. Yeah, and I guess that's another big one, too. I think when the first fad first started coming out, that was just when the gas prices were at their highest. Yeah. And people were saying, oh, we're going to go uh, buy a bike and start riding it yeah. to work. But in Taiwan, there are very few very, very few places that actually have showers and facilities right. that in the workplace right. that you can And you're ride. talking, if you're, if you're riding your bike somewhere, even three in the afternoon, oh. you're going to be soaked, you know, yeah, yeah. by the time you get there. It's not comfortable, you know, it's not comfortable. And like I said, we're still unclear, you know, can you even ride these things in the city on the sidewalk? And even me going down the Jones scene, which is downtown, it's hard because there are quote-unquote trails that are marked, 
but they're completely, you know, parked in with motorcycles and cars, so it's not convenient. In Taipei, the infrastructure is a little bit better. They actually have bicycle crossings across the main streets. Oh, nice. And uh, they try to emphasize it. I know at, at National Taiwan University, you have to have little licenses for your bicycle yeah. to bring it onto campus. Yeah. Which is kind of, just kind of, these are too many. Too, too many, many yeah. yeah. In fact, I've had, I had two bicycles at Chenda uh, confiscated in oh. the summertime. They're clearing them out all the time. There's so many of them. Yeah, university areas, of course, are special. But, you know, is this a fad? I'm going to call it a fad. And, you know, if you're watching this five years from now, you check it out and you find out bicycle sales are still great in Taiwan. It's not a fad. I think it's a fad. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned that tells me it's a fad, uh, I agree there's more trails. In fact, today we went out and checked out our old trail, which I don't know if you still ride on it. I gave up riding on it because I, I ran over somebody <laughs> once. It's too packed. It's too busy. Too busy. Too many families. Old men. Weaving down the... <laughs> <laughs> right. A little bit Hard too to get by them. I saw a great sign. We saw a great sign that it, it had uh, no motorcycles, no cars, and no ox carts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they've really improved that. In fact, there's two brand new bridges on it. That used to use to cross the road. Now they're bridges. So they've really done a lot on that. So I was really impressed. But, you know, does that lead to something? You talked about those fold-up bicycles. I was coming up here on the motorcycle, which is, this is the first time I've come up here on my motorcycle. I saw, like, three adults trying to get up this mountain on one of those. I've seen people go across the cross island no. highways that go up to 3,000 meters elevation on those <laughs> little bicycles. They're very, very... Uh, also, actually, this breeds into a whole bunch of other different areas. They have... Uh, uh, there's a huge bicycle magazine industry here as well. Oh, I don't really? know if you notice that if you go to the bookstores, they have, um, like, the not so much mountain biking, but you know, the, the biking magazine, where to travel in Taiwan. But they also have a magazine, or maybe several magazines, especially for folding bicycles. Okay, I'm going to go to the bookstore and check that out. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Yeah, the, the ma uh, uh, this is unusual. The magazine industry, that should be another show, actually in the greater China is doing great compared to in the West where it's all died out. Well, another thing to do with the fads too, and mm. to move this on to uh, China, is recently the, I don't know if you know, the giant, uh, the founder of Giant, who's in his 70s now, uh, he went to China to just cycle. I, I can't remember the route. I think it was from like, uh, Beijing to Shanghai. Yeah. Like that to promote giants in China. Where, of course, in China right now, biking is still what the poorest people do. So, yeah, right. in these high end bikes, no one would be willing to buy them yet. Yeah. But right. I guess he's hoping that in the future it'll become like Taiwan where everyone will buy a bike. Yeah, that's the weird thing, though. I mean, uh, for many years, the bikes were all just these broken yeah. down things. And then you go to China, everybody's riding a bike before. Now, still a lot. You know, you go to China, still a lot of people riding bikes. And so you got to change that mindset. I think that mindset's been changed in Taiwan. But, those little bikes make me feel it's a fad, to be honest. That's what makes me feel it's a fad, because, I don't know. <laughs> well, I've seen, they're folding, they're folding bikes, and I've seen cars with car racks yeah. with a folding bike on the back of it, where they could have just fold it and put, put it, it in, in the trunk. car. <laughs> so they bought a rack. See, to me, it's, a lot of it is just like the fish tank thing and the dog thing. How many um, pure breed dogs do you see running the streets in Taiwan? Yeah. Some really expensive, beautiful dogs just don't... Alaskan Huskies. Yep. This is sad. But, I mean, this tells you it's all about that consumption and the face of consumption. So, of course, there's a lot of research published on this recently over the last five to ten years about Chinese emphasis on face and how they feed into this kind of high-end consumption. And when you go to somebody's house, inside their house, they could live very basic. You know, even, I bet even the president of Giant, if you visit his house, you know, probably inside basic, you know. But when they go outside, they got to have a Benz, right? You got to have, if you're going to ride a bike, you got to get the most Carbon expensive one. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, really. And so these guys getting these folding bikes makes me feel it's faddish. You know, it's yeah. kind of just getting onto this thing. So we'll see in a few years what, what happens. Basically, I'm at a point where I'm afraid to go out on my bike now because every place is so crowded. <laughs> it kind of spoils uh, at first it was just like ah oh, it's just us riding yeah so now, right, right. Now well, I mean the high performance wheels. bike right you got a high performance bike yeah, I, I've got an okay bike I mean I really like to push the limit and go as hard as I can but you can't when the road's crowded you know it makes it extremely dangerous yeah. well recently they've also been having uh, they've been promoting uh, bicycle races races uh, I know uh, about that they go from they go from uh, low elevation starting basically at sea level they go up to oh. near Alishan Thousand, 3,000 meters, and I joined one of those, and there were thousands of people, and the majority, I would guess, are, have bikes that are about $30,000. Yeah. 
or more. Yeah. So if you so you're talking about a lot of every people, person, and they're all wearing the, the all the equipment, equipment yep. and they all have the, the most expensive yep. helmets, and yeah, it's, a, it's a huge they get, industry. They get they get the padded uh, pants, pads the crotch mm -hmm. and everything. They get the uh, tight fitting uh, sweat clothes, right? Air, uh, what do you call these things? That air jerseys, out right? jerseys, yeah. yeah. They get the they get the sweat things on the head and the helmets. Out of that group, though, you see that are you know all going up the mountain. How many of those bikers do you really think are oh, bikers? Yeah. Well, I guess it's like a face thing, and also it's, uh, a group. Thing, right? mm -hmm. They seem a to come out thing. in groups. Join the group. Yeah. Join the group. And this place, this location that we're at right now, is actually really interesting because right below us is uh, Taichung Science Park, which has yes. some of the biggest in, uh, like uh, chip firms and LCD manufacturers in the world are down here. And uh, and in the evenings. You can come up this road on a weekday evening. You can see over 100 cyclists coming up here. And they're usually in a big group. They'll come and they'll rest and take a break. I'm guessing that they come, they finish late shift, right. probably like at 9 o'clock at night. And then they decide to get some exercise and they come, and they come up as a group. It's yeah. probably organized in the company yeah. somehow. Yeah, Taiwan companies are great for that. They organize everything and they all get together and do things. Yeah, that, we should mention that. That's the park behind us. Maybe we're going to uh, walk around, shoot a little bit. But um, it's beautiful. There's a whole huge new, I don't know if you've seen it, they're building a whole new huge road that comes directly into the park. I had a hard time riding my motorcycle because all the roads are blocked, all this construction. So it's a big success, a lot of things going on, a lot of rezoning. So conclusion, I don't know, you're, you're kind of leaning, it's not such a fad. Well, I think it's a fad, but it's probably, well, maybe, well, actually I kind of hope because it's a healthy <laughs> fad. Maybe it'll stick around maybe it'll for a last. while. And I think the, the the big companies like Giant Merida, they're really they're pushing this to try to make the money. Um, I've been on some big bike trips just with a couple of friends, and I've seen uh, I've seen vans, I've seen buses, whole tour buses, mm. empty tour bus goes by, and then there's a whole pack of cyclists yeah. that they're doing tours of Taiwan so in about ten to fourteen days, wow. and they're I think I don't know if they're sponsored, but they're all riding giant bicycles. Mm. And the bus has a giant sticker on it, but they're not from Giant. So the bus is like taking them somewhere, and then they're all getting off and riding well, some kind is, of circuit or something. Well, this is kind of interesting how it works. So I was riding with a friend. We were riding from Taichung down to Yongshan, which yeah. is, uh, I guess, in March. Okay. And we were riding, and we passed this big group of people, and they have a guy. Or, well, first, we passed a van that was driving really slowly with logos on the side. Yeah. And they, the, the guys were hanging hey, where do you get these bikes from? And it was kind of interesting it was like, because it's, I guess they're, they're curious to see what other people are doing, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. And we passed them. And there's this big group of about 20 to 30 riders, all all with uniform, well, they call the jerseys and stuff, but all with giant bicycles. And at the front of the pack, there's a leader with a remote microphone, or with a remote headphone, yeah. talking to the guys in the car, and he's uh -huh. adjusting the speed. So anyways, we passed them, went to a rest area, uh, washed up and stuff, and then we had lunch. And then they passed us. And after we got on the road again, we, we, uh, we caught up with them, and they were resting, and it, was very, it must be very very nice. They were sitting there with their bikes underneath of a, a overpass, yeah. nice and cool, and, yeah. one, and they have a giant city bus. Not a city bus. Oh, a big, a big tour bus tour thing. Bus, tour tour bus. bus, yeah. With air conditioning. And what they could do is they, in their lunch break, they put it in, they go sit in the bus. <laughs> with the AC have, on? They have uh, <laughs> lunch. They can go eat lunch in the You're bus. You're talking about those big buses with the big yeah, soft with chairs. The big soft chairs and stuff. And I never saw them in America. I never yeah. saw them in Canada. They big soft chairs, all puffy, all air conditioned. So it must be really nice for them because they can have a nice thing. And then they get off the bus and then they can continue riding. Uh, we talked to the leader as we passed them. They said they do about 100 just to over 100K a day. You think they pay to join that group? Oh or yeah, something? yeah. This is a, it's, and it's. I've heard of this, but I've looked into this a little bit more. Giant is also sponsoring this, and here's another interesting one. Giant is trying to. Well, they're not trying to. They are making, uh, I guess, uh, cooperative arrangements with hotels around Taiwan, and they're trying to do like bicycle hotels. Interesting. interesting. So Giant's really working to make they're it really, really embedded. Working. Embedded. And I think yeah. Recently, Merida has been a little bit behind in the time, so they're trying to. Do the same thing as Chinese. Interesting, China. interesting. Well, that makes a lot of sense because the tour stuff, as we've talked about before, Chinese love to go on tours in groups. They rarely go. I mean, some people do. Some people are adventurous, but the majority, they want to get with a group and they want to all manage. Yeah. yeah. And that makes so much sense. You ride your bike, you get to a rest point, you get on an AC bus, and you sit down and have a rest, and you have a nice lunch that's all arranged for you. That sounds. That sounds so. Yeah, that fits the the the, the culture so well. So I think that's Giant's huge advantage is fitting right into that culture. Money-wise, 
what are the money making opportunities? It seems to me what I've seen is one of the big money making opportunities is all the paraphernalia stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I agree. And also, I guess with these companies moving out into trying to do a great interest with hotels and mm -hmm. tours, that I guess I'm sure that the sales of bikes have that the increase has got to yeah. be dropping. Because yeah, everyone think, has yeah. a bike now. You can't yeah. have more than yeah. one or the two. The market's kind of saturated. Yeah. And then you're going to get people get used stuff and all. But I think that's where Giant's advantage is. And that's where that local really pays off. Because they can get those tours together. They can really fit in well. So we'll see how they do in China. That'd yeah, be interesting to question. see if they can do the same thing in China. Because I have a, a friend who has an interesting story. He, he, he bikes in China from oh. work to his apartment. And he was uh, uh, brought his bike into the elevator at his apartment. And he's standing there, and then he's listening to the, the people in the, in, the, in the elevator talking, and they're saying, oh, look at that foreigner. He must be so poor. He has to ride a bicycle. <laughs> because, right. they, yeah, because in China, if you ride a bicycle, you don't have the money to afford a taxi yeah, or a right, car. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that psychology is hard to overcome. And I just think it's interesting how it's happened in Taiwan, right? Because it was not that long ago. It was the same kind of attitude. But, and the amazing thing is the change, right? Just, mm -hmm. again, like three or four years, suddenly no one to yeah. everyone. Right. And yeah, right. not from just junk bikes that old people ran, uh, rode to these um, uh, like expensive Scott Super carbon expensive. fiber yeah. bicycles yeah. that uh, just like an average secretary. Yeah, I mean, I want to say that, you know, I think if I was in the U.S. and hanging out with some buddies, it would be rare we'd ever see a carbon fiber bike. Here, you just go up to where we just were in the park, you know, a high percentage of people are riding carbon fiber bikes because, you know, they went to buy it and that was the most expensive one, I guess. I think so. I've, uh, <laughs> Oh, here's another little little story. I was in the giant bicycle store, and I was just looking through some stuff, and a guy came in. I think he must have come from the science park because he had his uh, little tag on and stuff. Yeah. He came in, and he says to the boss, you know, like, oh, is my bike ready? The boss says, oh, yeah, it's just over here. And it was a $200,000 carbon fiber Scott mm -hmm. mountain bike. It's and the guy, like the guy, he US walked dollars, up to it, right? and you think if he spent $200,000 on that nice bike, he'd want, I want to take it for a test spin. But no, he picked it up, walked out the door, put it in the back of his car, and yeah. drove away. Didn't even do anything. Didn't even, yeah. didn't even put his foot on the pedal yeah. or anything. Yeah. Yeah. And your point is, <laughs> are you inferring something? <laughs> it's more for looks than it is for riding. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the faddish part of it. I think that's it. You know, if you're going to do it, you go for the top. So anyway, what are some other money-making opportunities? Paraphernalia is big. Bikes have probably saturated the market. So I guess we're moving on to tours now. Service. Service, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you look at the bike stores now, they're starting to promote, just like they do with cars, right? Mm -hmm. Come in for your, uh, your, your monthly maintenance of your bicycle yeah. for a yeah. small fee. Yeah. Clean it up, get it all balanced again, get the chain working again. So service in the sense of, you know, servicing your bike, but also service in the sense of making a trip, making an adventure out of it, biking adventures. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think, do we have anything like that back home in Canada or America where you pay a group of people, they take you on a bike tour group? Uh, there's some, there are some ones. I, I guess I it'd know be like adventure tour or something. Canada yeah. or across the U.S. Yeah. Or many people do trips in Europe, but I think a lot of that is individual. Yeah, you do it yourself, you, you set it up. And there may be places that are, you know, friendly to yeah. it, but this is what we're talking about here. They just do it all for you. We love the big package. Okay, I'm going to go around the park a little bit. We're going to go into the Taichung Metropolitan Park. Are they open at night? Yep. Yeah, they're open until uh, 11. They close the gates up here. Oh, cool. We'll shoot around in there a little bit because I think that is actually this park was really the first place in Taichung that really had a lot of biking. Yeah, and they have bicycle rentals up there. Yeah, you rent a bunch of bikes, yeah. And I, before that, you know, I think a lot of people didn't have any realization. And we're going to shoot a little bit of the um, high-tech park. What's it called? The... The Central, Taiwan Central Science, Park. Science Park, and that's where a lot of the fab plants are, a lot of big buildings, and uh, lots of uh, production going on. Okay, Darcy, thanks a lot, and I know you're the uh, expert, and you're going to be up here riding your bike again maybe uh, next week. Yeah, I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, then, that's it. Thanks. You go up that way. I'll go up this way. Can we see the city? Oh, that is such a beautiful shot. Just leave it there for a minute. It's really nice at night. That is really nice. This camera is real good in low light. Could have cut some um, glare. The, the moving scenes in there. Oh, because the lights are going to punch it through. They're going to be too hot. Right? Yeah. It'll look bad. This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. 
Our website is ccc.qbook.tv, where you can find other audio and video episodes with photos, links, and information related to today's conversation. Subscribe to leave comments and access research episodes with applied topics and research reports.